there was a point early on, people often ask me, well, was there a point when you were kind of shaken or you thought maybe you had some doubts? Well, I started off with doubts. I didn't think it was true, period. But who tries to prove that Peter Pan didn't exist or who tries to prove the Easter Bunny is a, you know, this is all to me, yeah. all equally stupid. So it wasn't like I was trying to prove anything. But as I read the gospel accounts, I had several like moments where I was like, oh, dang, that does. I see that in legitimate eyewitness accounts. I've seen that kind of thing before. I've seen that kind of thing before. So finally, I just said, let's just, let's just investigate him and see where, where, where this goes. <laughs> Welcome back for another episode. We are in for such a treat today. As you just heard in that introduction, we have not only someone who's so impressive with so much wisdom and so much knowledge, but he is very much just on fire for Jesus and sharing Jesus in every aspect of his life. He is an author. He's a podcast host. He was a former homicide detective. We have Jay Warner Wallace on with us today. Jay or Jim, as you told me to call you. Thank you so much for being on today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Oh my goodness. Well, you know, and and as we always say, the mission of Made to Shine here, as I was talking to you right before we hopped on, is very much to remind every single person, they have a ministry. It's not just preachers. It's not just pastors. It's the way you live your life. It's the way you're kind to your friends and you honor and love your parents and your in the cl or in the classroom, your teachers, whatever have you. And um, in all the spaces you hold, I mean, you do so much. You're an author of one of my favorite books I've ever read or read. Um, you're a podcast host. You're you've been on like in all these different interviews and doing all these conversations. You were a professor. You're you go to UC Berkeley a lot to talk to students. Like you do so much. You're also a grandfather. Um, you're a husband, and you shine your light in all those areas so beautifully. And so very much wanted to have you on to to bring wisdom to this community. And again, just so excited to have you on. Um, before we dive in, we've got to kick off this episode with the way I kick off every single Made to Shine episode, which is, what is your favorite quote and why? Well, it's a quote that, sadly, you know, when you write books, there's one guy, one famous author, that if you quote him and people aren't careful, they'll think that you said this instead of the person you're quoting. And so I often mm -hmm. will see this quote attributed to me, and it's not my quote. It's a quote that I often talk about on the stage from C.S. Lewis, where he talks about in a, in a book called God in the Dock, which is, he says, God in the Dock. The dock is basically where you would sit if you were being cross-examined by an, an attorney. So it's like, if you, this book is basically, what let's put, put God on trial, basically. In his book, God in the Dock, he has this quote where he says that uh, Christianity, if it isn't true, is of no importance. If it is true, it's of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And when I became a Christian, I did not know of C.S. Lewis. I was about 35 when I first began to read through the Gospels. And I wasn't aware about this whole body of work called Christian apologetics. So when I did discover Lewis and read that book and read that quote, it really stuck with me because I knew that this was not the kind of truth like, you know, um, the Los Angeles Rams are a good football team. Okay, well, that may or may not be true, but that's a claim that really doesn't have much impact on my life. It's okay. It's important, I guess, to some people. But this is a different kind of claim. The resurrection is a claim that will change yeah. everything. If it's true, it's the most important truth claim will ever be proclaimed. And if it's not true, we should just walk away from it. But we can't treat it like the Rams are a good football team. We've got to treat it like it's really, it really matters. It's, it's of an infinite importance to us. Man, that's so good. I think too, I know I at one point kind of fell into that category of treating it moderately, so to speak. And I think a lot of like the age group we're speaking to, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of people are sitting right now. And 
one of the reasons, you know, I picked up and everybody cold case Christianity. I literally, Jim, I have this like bookmarked, highlighted. Well, and you have and the original because... copy. You have the one that was the first. This is, we're like in three different versions of this book. The, the one that came oh, yeah. out after that was the one after God's Not Dead 2, the movie. And then yeah. we have the 10th anniversary. So you, I give you credit. You actually have the very first copy ever printed. I have the OG. There you go. Um, which I didn't even know that. So that that's awesome to know. But no, the reason I... um kind of found your work is because very much to what you said, you know, a couple months ago, I was very much in that. I've always been a Christian, grew up a Christian. My parents were Christian and introduced me to the faith, but it was like, okay, if I'm really building my life on, on Jesus, I want to know what, I want to know the facts. Like if I'm going to give him my career, if I'm going to sacrifice relationships, like I want to know what am I building my life on? And that led me to Lee Strobel who wrote the forward for your book. And then that led me to you. And what I found so powerful is for what, 35 years, you were an atheist, you were a devout atheist. And then, you know, you're doing your work, you were a homicide detective, and then you start examining the gospels. Kind of talk us through what led you to what kind of the, the mechanisms of that transition looked like and what that nudging curiosity to just want to know more, because that's what I experienced. And I want to hear it kind of with your story, what led you to create this book? Yeah, I think, that, and, and maybe I'm lucky that I, I didn't come, you know, I think a lot of us look for some information about whether or not this is true, maybe many years after we become a Christian, we could become a Christian for a different reason. And then at some point, we maybe have a crisis of faith, or we start to think about these, like, is this really true? And then we start to look for support for our beliefs. And that wasn't my path in. I mean, I, I was the guy who held all of those objections. So I had to come in through the objections. I, I wasn't raised around any other Christians in my family. I had some cultural Catholics maybe in my family, but that was about it not really church attending folks. And, and I never attended an evangelical church until we walked into that first one. Um, you know, I, I was 35. Now I had a skill set in place. And I, by the way, I was only going because like my dad, who's not a believer, he'd be happy to go if his wife was a believer or his wife wanted to go because he wants to please, please his wife. He actually thinks that Christianity is useful, but not true. And I was in the same position. If you think it's useful for you, it gives you some sense of peace, or maybe it helps you raise certain values in your kids. I wasn't raised with that mechanism, but if it helps my wife to do it, I'd be happy to go because I love Susie. And so she wanted to go, so I went. Uh, neither one of us were believers, but I could. she had a real sense that there was something good here, something worth investigating. And so when I walked in and the pastor said that Jesus was the smartest man who ever lived, it changed things for me. Now, now look, I, I kind of um, describe that journey in two books. One, well, three. One is uh, Cold Case Christianity. The other is Person of Interest, which I wrote two years ago. And and the other was God's Crime Scene. I needed to know a couple of things. Number one, I did not believe God existed. So I needed to first journey across that question. It was my presupposition that there's nothing outside of space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry warranted. Like, did I have good reason? Because that's what I believed. I believed that you could, could explain everything in the universe with just the mechanisms of naturalism, right? Mm -hmm. Space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. Well, is that possible? Is that true? I never really had taken a deep dive into those things. We often will buy into the the kinds of things we're hearing other atheists say or other non-believers say, or what, especially now, back in those days, we didn't have social media to pump it out the way we do now. Yeah. So I just needed to know, does God exist? Because if there's no God, there's no Christian God. Then second, is the Bible telling me something I can trust about Jesus of Nazareth? And there's two aspects to this, right? One is, is it true? Is it evidentially true? The other is, is it beautiful? Is it good? Because hmm. I think for a lot of folks in my generation, I'm 62, uh, the question really is, is it true? Because we want to know, is it is it factually true? I think for a lot of people in this generation, because I've you know my kids are of a certain age, and my kids are between twenty seven and thirty five, and uh, twenty six and thirty five, and so there's an age group there, and I've got grandchildren now, and I think for the Gen Z and millennials, the bigger question is because the culture is telling you, even if it was true, it's not good. That what it teaches mm. about about women, what it teaches about relationships, what it teaches about marriage, what it teaches about sexuality, what it teaches about identity, what it teaches about the sanctity of life. These have all been rejected by the culture. 
Mm-hmm. So I needed to know two things, really. Number one, is it true? And number two, is it good? Now, my early work in books was focused on demonstrating why I think it's true. And my work now is focused on why I think it's good. And I think that that was part of my journey. How do we embed that? But how would you, how do you do that? How do you decide if the gospels are telling you the truth? You test them. You don't trust them. You test them. I didn't trust them. I had to test my way in. And once I got in, I I trusted them for not only what they said about Jesus, but what they said about me. And so I think that's that's what I would encourage anyone who's having doubts or who's maybe, and and I think we got to really check the biggest um, challenge I think we have as humans is Mm -hmm. pride. It just is. And do you know, even if you're not a believer, you don't like people who are overly proud, who think they're all something. Oh, yeah. You resist those kind of people. We do that even without even understanding why we do it. We don't like people who think they're something. We kind of resist those people. Well, we all think we're something. We all think we know the truth and we can design the truth for ourselves and we know everything there is to know about the the universe we live in. And, And because of that, we sometimes are resistant to learning something new. So Mm -hmm. the first encouragement I have for anyone listening is the only way in to any sense of learning something new, even if that something new is about the nature of Jesus or God, is Mm -hmm. an act we call humility. Without humility, you're never going to learn anything because you think you already know. So Mm -hmm. if you're you're examining Christianity for the first time, just make sure you're doing it from a position of humility. And for the people that aren't like the people that were like me that I think that it also requires humility to say, Hey, I've been following Jesus now my whole life. Mm-hmm. Cause my parents yep. told me to, right, brought right, to church right. on but it takes an amount of humility to say, but do I really know who I'm following? And right. an amount of humility to say, okay, I'm willing to look into this to the point where I could be proved wrong. I think that's where people run into the tension of they're afraid to ask the hard questions. They're afraid to ask the questions like, is God really real? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Is there evidence for it? Because they're afraid, like you said, Christianity has been really useful to them up to this point. And if it's not true, that usefulness is gone in their lives. So talk me through, I mean, you work with, like you, you've you seen a lot in this generation. I know you go to Berkeley to talk to students. Like what's going on in the hearts of people right now that's kind of preventing them from asking the hard questions, if any? Like what's that that tension they're afraid of going into? Well, I think that all of us, regardless of whether we're young or old, we all have a sense that we, and sometimes some Christian teachers will um, actually exacerbate this, uh, this, this, pro- this problem because they will, um, describe Christianity as, you know, God is good. And if you are obedient, God will bless you. Uh, that if you're not obedient, it's kind of like the book of Job. If you've ever read the book of Job and really yeah. gone through all of it, it's a long book. It's powerful because in there you have people who are Job's friends who have a very immature view of what God is like. Like they haven't really thought deeply about it. They just think that, hey, if Job is being uh, judged him, if he's suffering in some way, he's lost all of his family, he's lost his belongings, now he's got these sores all over his body. Well, Job, you must have done something bad, because either there's a God who doesn't care about you, or a God who's just you know, beating you up because you did something wrong. Well, it turns out that there's a loving God who may still allow you to suffer. And if you don't have a, a, a framework for suffering in your Christian worldview, you're holding the wrong worldview. You're holding the wrong version of Christianity because Jesus says this, you will have tribulation. Not you might, some of you will. No, all of you are going to face trauma at some point in your life. You are. Now, Jesus knows this because he faced trauma. He faced tribulation. And he said, but I have overcome the world. Now we want we're overcomers. We should be overcomers. But the question then becomes, well, how? So what I see is a generation of folks right now, young and old, who are trying to figure out how to get along with the culture so they don't suffer or face any trauma or any hardship. So maybe I can craft a version of Christianity that agrees with the culture on any number of those issues. And if it does, well, then I'm not going to suffer as much. Otherwise, I'm going to get blocked on all my social media. My friends and family are going to have all kinds of harsh things to say about me. I'm going to be seen as a religious fundamentalist who's rigid and unbending. Okay, nobody wants that. But the reality of it is, is that Jesus said, if you're really following me, that's exactly what you're going to experience. As a matter of fact, you should expect that. He says it's in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you will be persecuted 
for your faith in me. But don't mm-hmm. don't don't sweat it because your reward is not here. Your reward is in heaven. All the prophets were persecuted this way. Everyone who speaks the mind of God into a world of fallen humans is going to suffer because God's not like us. And his truths are hard for us because we're so deeply fallen. We so desperately want to do what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So we have to raise a generation and we have to be the generation that is willing. Look, it's, I think it was, it was it Spurgeon who said that, who was it? it was, maybe it was Missler, Chuck Missler. Somebody said this, and it stuck in my head, that the church began in homes under persecution, and it'll probably end in homes under persecution. Like, we've had a decent run in America where it seems like you couldn't even get elected to public office if you didn't at least say you were a Christian. Well, those days are gone. And now we have to face the fact that we are going to be much more like China in the generations that come than we are like the old version of, of the United States. We are going to be outcasts. Are you okay with that? Is this, are you a believer only when it serves its purpose for you? Are you a believer only when you're comfortable? <laughs> or are we uh, so willing good. to say that this is true, so true I can't move from it, and good, so good I won't surrender it and hold on to our Christian faith? You have this unshakable, this is true. Was there a moment in your research or like, was there a certain, I mean, you, you looked at all these eyewitness accounts in the gospels, like you treated them like you did your homicide detectives. Was there a moment that it was almost like, holy guacamole, this is the real deal? Or was it more of a gradual progression? It was a gradual progression for me because I, I work uh, the last part of my career, I worked nothing but cold cases, and those are just unsolved murders. And they're unsolved, you know, from 30 years ago because they were lame 30 years ago. They didn't have any eyewitnesses, you know, they just were not good cases. And so they just go unsolved. So when I get them, I don't expect them to be great. They're not great. They're they're kind of terrible. And so you build these, uh, I call it death by a thousand paper cuts. You build them on the strength of many small pieces of circumstantial evidence that cumulatively point to the same conclusion. And so then it becomes a weight issue. Right, like there's no aha moment because you're going, okay, yeah, this looks, yeah, they look, he looks pretty bad. No, no, he does look pretty bad. Like, oh well, yeah, this is he's the guy, he's the guy, and so you just kind of gradually get to the last straw and the camel's back kind of a thing, and mm-hmm. so these are just straws though. And, and so in the end, it, it is a cumulative case, but you can be just as certain from a thousand straws as you can from one heavy tree on that camel's back. You can be just as certain. So you, it's a, but I will say this, there was a point early on, people often ask me, well, was there a point when you were kind of shaken or you thought maybe you had some doubts? Well, I started off with doubts. I didn't think it was true, period. No, I wasn't trying to prove it wasn't true. Now, Lee Strobel, a friend of mine, he, you know, as you know, you, you said you read Lee's books and then you found ours. You know, Lee actually was trying to prove Leslie wrong, his wife. That wasn't me. I just thought this is absurd. Who tries to prove that Peter Pan didn't exist or who tries to prove the Easter bunny is a, you know, this is all to me, all equally stupid. So it wasn't like I was trying to prove anything. But as I read the gospel accounts, I had several like moments where I was like, oh, dang, that does. I see that in legitimate eyewitness accounts. I've seen that kind of thing before. I've seen that kind of thing before. So finally, I just said, let's just, let's just investigate them and see where, where, where this goes. Because I just when I was reading through them, you know, they don't agree. They have several areas, if you compare the Gospels to one another, where you're going like, yeah, this seems different, a different way of saying it. Oh, perfect. That's what every witness does. That is so common among the eyewitnesses that it's like the hallmark of, of, of true eyewitness. Uh, this is what defense attorneys love when they get to trial. They want to exploit these differences as if they can't be trusted. But the reality of it is, is that if you have reliable eyewitnesses, they're going to disagree in exactly the same way here that I see in the Gospels. Really? So I just wanted, that's what provoked me. But there was a time early on, you know, when I'm getting into this investigation, I'm thinking, okay, we're, we're maybe a th- two or three steps into it. And I'm in a bookstore. And I see a book called The Lost Gospels. Um, I think it was called The Lost Gospels. And I thought, really, there's more out there? I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about Christianity, so I had no idea. There was an entire body of work for the next four centuries after Jesus lived in which people were writing claims about Jesus. That's the kind of impact he had, by the way. That's the kind of impact you would expect if he's who he said he was. You would expect that it wouldn't just be, you know, the four Gospels are the only accounts. No, no, no. no. Anytime you have a real person, you also have a legendary version of that person. If he's had the kind of impact that Jesus had, you would expect the real Jesus and the legends. 
And if you read the, the legends that are called the non-canonical gospels, you will see all kinds of crazy things. And I didn't know how to judge what, what to make of that. So I had to go back and research. I bought that book. That opened up the door to all kinds of non-canonicals. I went out and did further research, collected all the non-canonical gospels, figured out where are they from, when did they first appear in history, what's been said about them, what's been done with them, what's the language, what, what, what is their use of pronouns and cities, and what do they, how do they differ? Just really did a deep dive forensically into yeah. all the non-canonicals. And that's what took me so long, I think, really, because you have to figure out, like, why do we embrace the four uh, gospels in the New Testament? When there are, in fact, other Gospels out there, well, because they're late. The four Gospels in the New Testament are early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses. The other Gospels aren't. So you know if somebody says, yeah, um, I, I saw this crime in 1970, but they were born in 1980, you probably shouldn't trust their account. Because mm -hmm. they popped up late and they, have, they weren't there. <laughs> well, I need to know, uh, yeah. are the writers of the Gospels, were they there? And so that's what I, and some, some were and some weren't. Look, Luke tells us that he wasn't there. He says, I'm talking to the people who were. Okay, that still works for me. I just need to know, is this based on data that dates back to the life of Jesus? Or does this start 100 years after the fact in some little niche group in North Africa who's trying to start a movement and just piggyback off of Jesus and his good name? I just mm -hmm. needed to know. And so that yeah. started a whole nother. So yeah, that was part of that process for me to figure it out. That, so something in that when I was kind of reading through, because obviously I've never been a homicide detective. I don't know the tactics or how to mm -hmm. like look at the, the gospels these, this way. And so something you said, I thought just, just kind of made me look at things differently and my questions differently. And it was, you don't have to have every answer to every question to know something is true. That's right. And I think about nowadays in today's society, we're like, if you can't answer that, it's, it's, it's gone. Like there's, it doesn't hold any ground. And so I'm curious, like what we're kind of, if now the overarching kind of still open-ended questions that we, we can't answer that you've experienced and what about Christianity? Like what kind of bullet points in your research have you continued to come back to that say, yeah, but we still know this is true because of this. Yeah, it's a good, really good point. We, I tell jurors all the time, I can tell you everything you need to know, but I can't tell you everything that could be known. Two different things. Uh, there are lots of, I've never had a case in front of a, a jury that I could answer every question. So if you're somebody who needs every question answered in order to render a verdict, we simply won't impanel you because that would be impossible. By the way, there's that's pretty much your, the case for, like we're at right now, we are recording this on a platform. Do we have any idea how that works? Uh, no. We, we trust that it works. Uh, do we know what the actual mechanism is for how it works digitally? Do we understand the algorithms or the programming that's involved in this? No. We're going to drive a car tomorrow, today, but that I have no idea how half that car, works. especially now. <laughs> just bought a brand new car, and I can tell you that there's so much technology in that car. I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. So I couldn't, even, I couldn't give it a tune-up. So there's tons of stuff that you, you put a key in a lock. You have no idea how the tumbler mechanism works in the lock. You just trust when you put the key in, it always opens it. So there's, you, your entire life is based on movements and actions that you take when you have less than perfect information. You always have open questions, yet you still act. You'd be frozen in fear if you had to have every, if you're the kind of person who's like, I need to know what's going to happen next. I need to know how this is going to, you wouldn't even get out of the house. It'd be unsafe to go out of the house. So we do this all the time. And when you get to the end of the evidence trail in a jury trial and you step across your unanswered questions, that's called rendering a verdict. We have more than enough evidence that Christianity is true. When we get to the end of the evidence trail, we take a step. It's called a step of faith, but it's based on the evidence trail that points right to that suspect. And yes, it's short. A few quick. Now, what kinds of questions are unanswerable? There's tons. Right, but they don't mount to anything to me. Uh, there's both theological and factual questions. For example, uh, we only have a partial examination, well, partial uh, description of Jesus's childhood. I don't know what he did between the, uh, you know, what is his his bapt his uh, christening, his in the temple. He's in the temple. We see him again in the in the temple at twelve. What's 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 going on there? What after the temple at twelve? He got another what? 18 years that are undescribed come on what, what's happening there don't know don't know 
um, we, we don't know, for example, some theological questions, you know, what is the relationship between God's sovereignty and our free agency? And lots of people argue about that, and there's lots of theological ideas, but we don't really. So a lot of times the, the questions you can't answer are what we would call Christian non-essentials. And if it's clear, then it's probably an essential. If it's unclear, it's probably a non-essential. Something we can debate uh, as a family, but not something we should divide over as a family. So I think that a lot of it for me was trying to figure out, do I have, look, what, the test I gave it was, is it written early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses too? Can it be corroborated in some way, even though I know that every corroboration is what I call touch point corroboration. We don't have videos in our trials. We have old cold cases. There was no video available. So I'm going to have lots of open questions, even though I have certain pieces of evidence that corroborate certain items within the eyewitness account. Three, does he change his story over time? Four, does he have a reason to lie to me? Those are the four areas that juries are instructed to test eyewitnesses. And I just did that test with the Gospels. And do they pass that test? Yes. Now, do you, here's what's great about God. <laughs> Is there more than enough evidence for you to infer that Jesus is who he said he was? Yes. Is there enough open questions for you to reject it? Yes. Why would God do it that way? Why wouldn't God just make it so that each of us is born with an innate understanding of God and his son? Never even needs to be mentioned. Or why wouldn't God come to us in a dream when we're all 10 years old, every one of us the same way, and flip that switch for us? Why would he make it so? that there is good reason to believe it's true, yet enough wiggle room for people to reject it. It's because what God wants is what we want. Why is it? You don't want a spouse who's forced to love you, who only loves you because he gets a paycheck at the end of the week, or who only loves you because he's been threatened by somebody who if he doesn't say he loves you, he's going to be shot. That's not real love. That's coercion. Well, God's the same way. He's seeking a relationship with us, but relationships have to be offered freely. In other words, there has to be enough wiggle room for you to make a choice freely to love the person to whom you're in a relationship with. Mm -hmm. Well, the only way God could do that, it seems to me, would be to give you enough reason to believe it's, it's true, yet leave you enough wiggle room so you can still make a free choice. He's a respecter of persons. Now, of course, Scripture says he's no respecter of persons, but in one way he is, in the sense he gives you free agency, and in another way he isn't because he's not impressed by us. Yeah. So in the end, uh, I think for us, we have to look at it and say, okay, there's more than enough reason to believe this is true. Are there open, unanswered questions? Sure, sure. And if you want to reject God, no problem. Get that. I, I, by the way, I, I'm not – the cop in me says, hey, if you want to defund the police, knock yourself out. I know where that goes. So I'm patient. I'm willing for you to do that silly thing and see where that goes. If you want to reject mm -hmm. God's existence, no problem. I know where that goes. And if I'm patient, if you want to see how that runs, go for it. But the reality of it is we've got more than enough reason to know we should be in, in the group, in the family called the family of God. In the beginning, you were talking about kind of the two phases of your research. All right, friends, who likes to feel good? Not only feel good, but do good work. Now, if there's anything I know about this Made to Shine fam, it's that we have goals and we like to be productive. You wouldn't listen to this kind of content if you did not. And I'll tell you what, you guys know me by now. I'm someone that I like to be productive. I like to get a lot done, but that's really stinking hard when you're not feeling your best. When you kind of have that, what I like to call that mental fog going on. And a few months ago, I was trying everything. I was trying different things to kind of create more mental clarity, but I ran into this problem of, I was taking like I was drinking so much. I was drinking coffee. I tried matcha and nothing really worked. Nothing worked sustainably and nothing was convenient. There was nothing that was quick. That was simple until I found magic mind. Yes. Insert magic mind into my life. What I love about Magic Mind is, of course, it's all natural. Y'all know I have very high standards for what I put into my body. So it has your ashwagandha. It has your matcha. But it's so convenient. There are these little bottles that you just, you just sip. 
it's easy. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to spend a thousand minutes curating this perfect coffee and you're good to go. You feel amazing. It helps with your productivity. So I'm not the only one who thinks this, you know, Joe Rogan, the Kardashians, Brooke Shields, they're all on this magic mind trend. And lucky for us, if you use the code made to shine 20, you're going to get up to 56% off your first subscription order. That is made to shine 20 up to 56% off your first subscription order. Y'all, we all deserve to feel amazing. We all want to take our work seriously. This is how you can do that in an easy, simple, convenient way. Knowing what you're putting into your body is good and natural. Excited for all of our minds to feel magical after this search, which was one, is God real? Is this true? And then two, is this good? And I totally see my generation like reaching for things that they want to be good. We want goodness, right? I think people are calling it the universe and, you know, the, the, I don't know, the spirit of the world or what, I don't know. People are getting into all these different things. And what is so silly to me is like, here's this thing that you're saying is true and you're saying is good. What make, I mean, what do you think, why are we reaching for all these crazy things to label what is found in Christianity if it's so blatantly, not obvious, but if it has the historical evidence to back it up, unlike all of these other things we're reaching for? Well, I mean, part of it is we have to define what we mean by good. So when I say that, is it true and is it good? I mean that it's objectively true and objectively good because there's subjective truths and there are objective truths. So the difference basically is this. Um, if I said that, um, you know, apple pie is the best dessert, well, that's my subjective opinion. I'm making a claim. It's based in what I believe. I'm the subject who grounds the claim. That's why we call those kinds of claims subjective truth claims. If I say that isoniazid is the cure for tuberculosis, well, I can't, that's not my opinion. I couldn't say, well, yeah, but I believe it's Tylenol. Well, Tylenol is not going to cure TB, so you could try it, but it's not going to work because that's not grounded in my opinion. It's grounded in the object known as isoniazid. It's either truly the cure or it isn't. And because it's grounded in an object and not in a subject, that's an objective truth claim mm -hmm. rather than a subjective truth claim. So when we say that Christianity is true, I don't mean it's true for me. I mean, whether I like it or not, whether I deny it or not, it's objectively true because it's that truth claim is grounded in the object known as Christianity. When I say it's good, oh, now that's a, that's a, that's a weird value. That's a, that's a moral value, moral claim. Are there objective moral truths? Yeah, there are. It's it's never okay to torture babies for fun. Every subjects don't decide that. If you found a subject who says, "Don't to me, it is okay," you'd say he's crazy, because you realize it's not grounded in a subject. It's grounded in something that transcends the subject. Mm -hmm. It's an objective claim about. It. So when I say it's objectively good, that changes the game completely. Because where do we? How do we ground subjective, I mean, objective truth claims that are moral? Well, they come from the mind and nature of God. The, ob, ob, the this, this is the thing that transcends all groups. Because by the way, even if a culture said, well, our culture affirms this, that's a group of subjects. It's still a subjective truth claim. Mm. We're saying that even you know, if there's a war between two groups and they have two different sets of values, moral values, you, you, how could I argue with the other group if, if all moral values come from groups? And whatever value you hold, that's fine. It's equally valuable to ours. No, we would say, no, there's an objective truth that, that kind of arches over both groups. And we want to find out what that is. So what we want to do is seek the objective good, seek the objective truth, because that's the one that overarches all of us. And I think what, we're in a culture right now, and think what happens in social media. Yeah. Social media puts the, the, the focus on subjects. It's my personal profiles. It's with the groups that I belong to on social media. It, we have become so tribal. Well, what tribals are tribes are simply as groups of subjects that everything about truth has now become subjective. Like there are no objective truth claims. But even if someone says there are no objective truth claims, he's saying that he believes it's objectively true that there are no objective truths. You see, you can't get away with it because yeah. that's self-refuting. Because if someone says there's no objective truth claims, I'm going to say, is that objectively true? 
Yeah. Okay. You're stuck with it. You're, you're, that these exist. You, it, if that train is coming down the track, if you could tell somebody, I don't think it's coming, but it's going to hit you one way or the other because objective truth claims are like that. So we have to figure out what is objectively true about the universe. And, and then what is objectively true about the nature of God? And so that was really where I was at, right? I mean, this is, this is the, this is why I think for a lot of us right now, we don't think that if our friends are going to reject us, I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, well, I have gay friends and I love them. So do I, I, I came up in the arts. Okay. My undergraduate degree is in, is in design and my master's degree is in, yeah, is in, is in architecture. And I worked in an architectural firm in Santa Monica and, and trust me, a lot of my good friends, I wish this was not God's view. But it is. And because I believe that he is the source of objective truth, even objective moral truth, I have to bend Mm -hmm. my knee to him. It's not that I want this to be the case. It Mm -hmm. just is the case. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask the question for people. Well, look, at some point, is it all going to be about you? Are you? Well, and why, for example, would you think in a second that if there is a God, that he would agree with you on everything? No, no. If there's a God that you think agrees with your in, uh, instincts, that's not God. Mm-hmm. God, God's not. He's so otherly that mm-hmm. that he would. Ex, I would expect him several times for me to think. Well, I kind of think this, and him to go, "Nope, you're wrong." That's yeah. the nature of God. So if if you're if you're worshiping a God that you actually think agrees with your inclinations, your instincts, your impulses, it's probably not God. <laughs> I smiled as you were talking through that because the words like my truth, this is just my truth. That's such a saying right now. I mean, I, like even if you have a friendly debate or argument or make a suggestion, someone can come back and say, well, this is my truth. So you can't say that. Like that's a valid statement now. And um, and so I was giggling because it's so true. It's like, Your truth, like you mentioned, it's like God is the ultimate. He is the truth. Like that is you either kneel your, your, you kneel down to him or you don't. And you, you mentioned morality and, you know, it pegs the question of like, well, where does good and evil come from? Where, if you don't believe in a God, like where's the contrast? Where does that come from? And when I was looking through one of your YouTube videos, you were talking about the, like, why the question who created God is a silly question and kind of the personal versus impersonal force. Will you talk us through that and why, like, it's more pl- plausible to believe in a personal force? Because I just thought that specific video was so powerful. Well, a couple of things. Let me say this, too, uh, before we even jump over there. Remember when Oprah Winfrey was uh, at the, I think, the Golden Globes, and it was right after the Harvey Weinstein scandal. And she was talking to a room full of actresses, and she said, you know, it's so important for you to speak your truth. And she Mm -hmm. used that possessive pronoun, your. No, it's the truth. Because if if, if you're going to argue that there are versions of truth, this is mine, this, that's yours. Then why is it okay? That, so these actresses would say it's our truth that we shouldn't be treated this way. Harvey and Weinstein and a ton of other producers who have more power, have all the money, all the influence. They're going to say, well, it's our truth that if you want that role, you're going to do what I tell you to do. And that's wow. my truth. And since we have the position you want, it's going to trump yours. No, we, we think that Harvey Weinstein, no, there is a truth about that behavior. And we want to speak to the truth about that behavior. It's not like it's because if that's the case, why would you suggest that somebody who holds a different view is wrong? Because if it's all about my own personal view, then you're just arguing, well, that's good for you. It's not good for me. No, we think there's an actual truth about that behavior that needs to be exposed. Now, when we talk about the personal nature of God, there's lots of ways to kind of carve this, right? Because for me, the question only is, is that it's it's clear from the beginning of the universe that even the atheists who are working in cosmology would argue that there's something, there's a force outside of space, time, and matter that somehow initiates the universe. That could be a multiverse generator. That could be... They're not quite sure what that could be, but they would argue it when we find out it's going to end up being an impersonal force that is simply something akin to space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. There is no personal God. The problem with this, though, is that there's lots of evidence in the universe that points to personhood rather than just an impersonal force. I'll give you an example of this. Well, morals are an example of this. Look, science can tell you and physics can, 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 can say what happened. But they can't tell you why it should happen. They're good about the is, but not the should or could be. 
Um, so it's, it's, it, it's an art is hard to get from science because how can, how can physics and, and chemistry point to what you ought to do? It can only describe what is happening or what the consequence is for a certain action, but it cannot speak to what you ought to do. Uh, remember that all um, objective moral claims, uh, morals are, are obligations between persons. So, for example, I am not morally obligated to this cup. I can break it. Okay, I didn't create a, there was no moral harm done. But I am uh, morally obligated to a person holding the cup. If I punch that person instead of the cup, now I've done something that's morally uh, offensive. Why? Because moral obligations are between persons. If you feel you're in a universe in which there are moral obs uh, obligations, yet you know they cannot be subjective truth claims, these are objective truth claims, then the question is, who is the moral, who is the objective moral lawgiver to whom you're feeling obligated? Mm. Ah, now we're stuck mm. with an objective moral lawgiver because we know that all moral laws are obligations between persons. It's a personal moral lawgiver. Not only that, but you see there's DNA in, in code in science. The origin of life comes from, uh, not from physics, it's from information. Information guides everything. But you don't have a single example anywhere in the history of the universe in which information has come from anything other than a mind, person. Uh, information is basically I code it, you decode it. It's between persons. So the yeah. problem you have is that there's lots of good reasons to believe that whatever is guiding and creating and sustaining the universe is not an impersonal force, but rather a personal force. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of, th where does that lead? Well, it ought to lead you to think about what, what kind of divine, what kind of uh, transcendent personal force. You're getting pretty close to what we would describe as God. In a Instagram reel you posted not too long ago, you talked about like the um, fathers of science, so to speak, like some of the initial kind of people that established science and scientific, um, you know, what have you, just information research. They are some of the biggest people that point back to Jesus. And, um, and so I love that you kind of brought that in because I think we as Christians, we have in our brain what we think are the biggest objections from atheists. But I'm curious because you interact with people all the time that don't believe in God. And so are the biggest objections what we think to be true, which is like, you know, how can you believe in God when you see all this science around or who created the universe? Or, I mean, why does God let these horrible things happen if there's really a God? Like, are those the, the classic objections or are you seeing something else with this kind of upcoming generation? Well, I think that it, 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 it's just voiced differently, but I think it's always been that the, you're going to get all kinds of objections. And sometimes it's because people have thought very deeply about why they don't believe there's a God. And sometimes because they haven't thought so deeply about what they believe about God. But I think almost the, the vast majority are moral objections. Here's what I mean. It's that um, if there is a God, why would he allow this immoral thing to happen or this crushing suffering to occur? Why would God allow anything bad? Now, when I say that's a moral claim, because if you think about it, well, why are we calling it bad? It's because we believe that there's a moral element to this action, that this suffering has some moral component. This, this should, suffering by its nature is bad, but that means there has to be a world in which good and bad exist. So we can, yeah. so the, the question, or it could be, well, why would, it, why would you believe in your God when he's done all kinds of bad things in the Old Testament, when he allows all kinds of bad things to happen in nature, when he allows people to act badly, see, there's, this is this is so much, or when he judges people unfairly, well, that's a moral component there, what's fair, what's not fair, he, re he rejects yeah. people who maybe are in homosexual relationships, who have uh, gender identity issues that, he, that you disagree. You Christians, you hate everything. You're misogynist, you're transphobic, you're homophobic, you're, 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 you know, you, you don't even allow the women to have free choice. You see the problem? It's all about a moral objection. We, in other words, the objector says, we hold to these moral truths and you folks don't. And it's your evil God that it compels you to, to resist these moral claims. So a lot of it, I think, is going to be you know, is it good? And of course, the problem we have is that they've now taken that word, is it good? And they have a subjective view of what is good. They have a cultural view of what is good. And, mm -hmm. and like it has for 2000 years, Christianity flies in the face of our innate fallen sense of what we deem as good. 
as, as you would you expect if there's a God. Go ahead, say that again. Now. What would you define good as from a biblical standpoint? Okay, so here's the question I hear. I just saw it on, on our, one of our YouTube videos recently that, that it, it, there's some confusion about this. So if God is the author of good, well, then we got to ask yourself, does God create good? Is, is he just defines it. He says, okay, that's good. That's not good. That's good. Because if that's the case, it seems kind of willy-nilly, and he could change his mind. So maybe yeah. God could change his mind. Is that what's happening? Or is it that there are some things that are good, and God recognizes those things, and he makes a case for those. He, he claims those things in Scripture. So here's the problem. If God is the author of good and bad, well, then it's kind of random, and he could change his mind. If God is just recognizing what pre-exists as good and bad, then you don't need God. You can take him out as the middleman. We can just go right to what's good and bad. But the reality of it is, is there's a middle ground here, is that God is the not the author. Good and bad, like logic, like other aspects of the universe, are simply a reflection of God's innate nature. He doesn't proclaim these things. It's like mm. when you put salt in soup, it becomes salty. You put God in the soup, it becomes moral and logical because it's just simply reflecting his nature. And so we are in a universe that's steeped in the nature of God. And because his moral nature is such, we're going to we're going to seek and eventually we're going to find these objective claims. We're, we're actually discovering the nature of God. When you look at the non-contradictory laws of, of logic, you're discovering the logical nature of God because he's in a universe that tastes like God, like that salt in the soup. It tastes like the salt. And so that's what we're seeing in the universe is that this is not something that God just randomly creates. It simply reflects his holy nature. So we can yeah. discover moral truths, but we cannot create moral truths. And mm -hmm. that's what we have to look at and say, okay, so let's talk about what kinds of moral truths are there. Why do we believe? Look, most anyone who denies objective moral truths believes that things like justice are objectively valuable. Uh, everyone accepts some things as non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. You just discovered something then. How do you ground that? How do you ground something like that? So mm -hmm. we all do it. It's not like we're the only ones as Christians. So never feel Christians as though we're, we're the odd group out. No, everyone does it. We just have a yeah. better grounding for it. Everyone yeah. thinks, for example, who created God? Well, okay, well, you think that the universe was created by a multiverse generator? Okay, well, who created the multiverse generator? Everyone yeah. believes there's some kind of uncreated first cause. We just have better grounding for that because the evidence points to a personal force rather than an impersonal force. So yeah. in the end, we're all the same. We're all kind of saying the same things, but we just, I think, have better uh, footing for our, our claims. And I know we're we're coming up on time here, but I, you know, to your theme and to your point of evidence, I think what's so unique about your faith is that you came to it based off of evidence. Like that is what that is. I think most people, especially I'm from I'm from the South, right? Like the Bible Belt. That's where I've lived my entire life. There's so many people that are like, I'm a Christian because I went to church my entire life. That's just what we did on Sundays. That's my friends are all Christian and. Um, Granger Smith says like uh, a dog tag Christian, right? It's like, we have it on our dog tag because people need to know who's going to do our sermon if we died or whatever in world war two. And I think we have a lot of dog tag Christians out there. Um, what makes, so you, like you found the evidence for God and then you leaned it on Jesus and you did that by looking at the gospel accounts. What makes the evidence for Christianity different than any other religion out there? If like, is there historical evidence for any other religion out there? Like what makes this different? Okay. So, this, right. So there's, there, this is a very different kind of a claim about God, because if you look at Hinduism or Buddhism or Baha'i, um, these are not uh, claims about God that are grounded in the historical reliability of a single event. So uh, the wisdom statements from Confucius did not require that there even really be any event in which Confucius, Confucius uh, had any particular role. But ours is grounded in an event called the resurrection that's locked in a location on the planet at a particular time in a particular context. So if that's not true, then none of this is worth pursuing. It all comes down to the resurrection. But that's a claim about a historical event. That separates it from most theistic claims. So it's different. You know, how do you test wise wisdom statements? If, if the entire system was built on a, a book so read like Proverbs, how would you ever test it 
like fortune cookie statements. No, this is yeah. actually makes a claim about a history of a region and a and God appearing in the form of Jesus and dying on a cross and rising from the grave. Mm -hmm. That's that can be tested. And then there are other claims that are historically grounded, but not many. Mormonism, for example, is historically grounded. It actually makes claims. It embraces all the claims of the first century New Testament. Then it also makes claims about a visitation that Jesus makes to the North American continent. It can be tested. And by the way, if you test it, it fails miserably and quickly. So, so we need to be able to say, well, th this is the difference. If you said, hey, I'm a Christian because I was raised this way, or I had an experience that demonstrated Christianity is true. Well, I have six brothers and sisters who were raised LDS. My dad's second marriage, he raised a family. He's an unbeliever, <laughs> He's, but his second wife is a Mormon. So I have these folks who were all raised LDS. And they would tell you that they were raised in the church and they had an experience which confirmed for them that Joseph Smith, a prophet of God in the Book of Mormon is true. Yet, you know, that's not true. That's not, it's not, that's a, I, I tested it the same way I tested the book, uh, the New Testament at the same time, because my Mormon family was like, hey, you're interested in God? They sent missionaries yeah. to my front door. So I went through all the missionary teaching, but you test it under those four criteria. Were they really there? Can they be confirmed by some kind of corroborative evidence? Did they change their story over time? And do they have a reason to lie? And they fail in all four categories. So, mm. okay, I knew this, this is why if you take an evidential approach, number one, it'll lead you to truth. Number two, it'll keep you from falsehood. It'll keep you from lies. Because I became a Christian at the same time I became a not Mormon. Because I knew one system was true and the other was not because I tested both. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah, it'll keep you from keep falsehoods. you from lies. Now, here's the other thing about it is, is that it'll keep you from sounding like people who are falling for lies. If you're going to take the same approach that your Mormon friends do, because they're going to say, I was raised in the church and I had an experience that demonstrated this is true. If that's your claim as a Christian, it's insufficient. Here's the one thing they cannot say. I tested this to see if it actually occurred. They can't say that. There is no long, huge body of Mormon apologetics. Can't do it. Doesn't wow. work. So yeah. that's why we could. And that's why there's such a huge body of work in the field called of theology called Christian apologetics. It's because it could be tested and it passes the test. So that's why I think we want to stop sounding like our Mormon family, our Mormon wow. friends. This is so, this is why I wanted you on because going back to what we talked about, like this, this, my troop generation, I think a lot of people when they're asked, why are you a Christian? We go back to our experiences, which there's nothing wrong with how God has experientially moved in your life, but that's no different than just you talking about your truth. Like that's in a way subjective because it's maybe emotions you were feeling during the time, whatever have you. But if you go back to the evidence, that's why I want people to look at the evidence because I think we have a generation that's not doing the work. Like we're not testing our faith and how grateful and blessed are we to have a faith that God was like, test me. You know what I mean? Like right. I gave you it. Like, let's look into the hard stuff. Yes. Yeah, not and, a, It's um, not an either or. So it's not like, Hey, I'm saying to stop giving your personal testimony, but, but mm -hmm. be prepared to do what Peter says in first Peter three, you give the reason for the hope you have. Now, when Peter said this, he was saying it in the context of suffering. So we often misquote Peter or take him out of context and we're like, Oh yeah, we should all be, and I've done that too. But really what Peter is saying, hey, you're going to suffer differently than people who don't believe this is true. It's going to yeah. change everything. You're going to actually believe that there's a life beyond the grave if yeah. you test this and know that it's true. And that's going to change the way you wrestle with cancer. That's going to change the way you wrestle with the loss of a loved one. Of a loved one. It's gonna, you're still going to suffer. You're still going to be sad. But it's going to change the way you suffer. And that change is going to be so obvious to the world around them that then you can say, well, here's why. So I think for us, um, we want to be able to do both of these things. Share your testimony. But remember, the first century uh, apostles, when they were asked, tell me where you find anywhere where Paul talks. He talks about his journey, how he used to be a Pharisee, and now he's a believer. Does he talk about the change in his life? Uh, now I'm a good guy, or now I'm not a drinker, or no. No, his testimony is the testimony of an eyewitness who saw the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. That's called testimony, but it's not testimony about changes in me. It's testimony about the risen Christ. So be able to do both. Talk about the changes in you, but talk about the reason why you know the resurrection is true. Man. Okay. So let's say someone's like, all right, I need to work that second muscle. 
I need to start being able to talk about, you know, why and point to the evidence. What do they do, Jim? What do they start with? Well, I'll tell you what, that's a great way of putting it. I've, I've hardly ever talked about that way of working the second muscle. I'm going to start using that. I'll steal that from you. But, but, do it. but I, I, but I think what you do is you look, it's, I think that it's intimidating because people think, oh, you mean to tell me I have this whole other area of stuff I got to do? No, not really. Here's what I would say. You already do that and you're doing it for stupid things. So if you're a Rams fan, you already know why they're terrible this year or not what they used to be. And you already probably started thinking about who they should draft next year and should they keep Matthew Stafford for another year? And I mean, is, is, is Donald already too old now? I mean, did, did all their defense is getting old, blah, blah, blah. They got some good young receivers. Okay. But do you think, how do you know all that stupid stuff? You know it because you're interested. And when you're interested, you find yourself doing the research without even thinking about it. So I would say the first thing you do is you become interested because the truth is right now, most of us are more interested in something else than we are in the things of God. And I can tell you that's true because I just examine your time. How are you spending your time? How are you spending your resources? You have a phone, you have podcasts, right? You do a podcast. I do a podcast. If you just look at your friend's phones and look at their podcast list and you'll, you'll find out what they love. You'll find out what they think is valuable. You'll find out what they think they, what they worship. You know, it's probably not theology. It's probably not the case for God. It's probably something else. By the way, all of these resources, like your podcast, like mine, they're out there for free. Mm -hmm. Really, what does it take to do this? Nothing, zero. Just takes your, your, your passion. So I never say, well, start with this book, start with this podcast, start with this, that. No, no. Start with increasing your passion, because if you just do that, I don't have to tell you where to look. You're going to find those things innately because you're passionate. I didn't tell you where to find the podcast you're listening to now. You were just interested, and then you pursued your interests. How about mm -hmm. this? Let's be interested, and then just pursue our interests. That's so good. That's a great way to frame it, because as you said, it's like this is not another book you have to study or read for a college class. Like This is the rock on which you're building your life on. And, and like you mentioned, if you're listening to this podcast right now, that is you. Like no one's listening to this content for 52 minutes if they're not already somewhat curious. And so as Jim is saying, like explore that, allow yourself to explore that. Um, Jim, this has been so wonderful. I, I always cap off this with a, with a classic question. I, um, I personally hate the question, what advice would you give your 10 year old self? So I always ask what advice would your 10 year old self give Jim current day, Jim? Well, I, so I, I, I will be the old, uh, fuddy daddy who flips it back because I often think about as you get older, you, mm. you, I think when you're young, you think you could actually offer advice to your older self. When you get old, you realize <laughs> and I wouldn't trust anything that kid said. Okay. <laughs> that guy was an idiot. So I think for me, I, I can tell you one thing I would do. I say it all the time. Number one, I would have, I, I would have married my wife earlier. I met her in high school mm -hmm. and I was under that illusion that I had to have a college degree and everything had, every domino had to be in place a certain way before I could marry her. I would have married her. You know, I did, we waited nine years to get married. I would have married her much, much earlier. And I would have had kids much mm -hmm. earlier and I would have had more. We have four. I would have had a lot more. Um, so you I think, had more than four. I'm one of four. Yes. Well, so. no, I would have. I I, I think uh, there's this reading uh, recently about a quarterback in the NFL. He's played for the Chargers. I won't mention his name because he's got ten. Yeah. And I thought, oh, wow. I don't know if I could do ten. I know that Susie yes. would want to do ten, but <laughs> but I just think I would have had more uh, because I I think that's something as you get older you realize yeah all the mm -hmm. things I prioritize young were probably not that important. And, and I was mm. sold a, a bill of goods by the culture I was raised in. And I didn't become a Christian until I was 35. And by that time, a lot of those early choices were well in my rearview mirror. Mm. So I, I just say to the people that, 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 and I always say this, that there are certain trajectory decisions that you're going to make. And if you're in this audience listening, um, and I, we do a lot of work. I'm on faculty at Summit Worldview Ministries. It's in Colorado. And it's all high school, two-week immersion where we're teaching Christian worldview to high schoolers. And I often will ask them on the porch at the evening session, I'll say, look, what do you think is the most important decision you're going to make? Because some decisions are important trajectory decisions. What I mean is, if you're leaving planet Earth, 
and you're going to the moon and you're only a mile from the moon's surface and you make a two degree error, no big deal. You're only a mile from the surface. You're still going to make the moon. If you make the same two degree error as you're leaving planet Earth, you miss the moon by thousands and thousands of miles. Some decisions are important to make early. I call those trajectory decisions. So it turns out that there are, for young people, here are your trajectory decisions. I didn't realize this until I was older. I wish I knew this earlier. Number one, worldview. Because that's the, the decision you'll make that, that guides every other decision. So what is true about the world? Figure it out. Is it Christianity? Is it not? What is the overarching worldview that you're now going to make every other decision? Two, it's not your career. It's not your education. It's not your preparation for ministry. It's marriage. It's spouse. Mm -hmm. That's the number two trajectory decision. Wow. Because I've met people who made really poor spousal decisions and they had a pretty tough life. And I've met people who made really good, um, you know, the spousal decisions and even made poor work decisions, but they had a great life because wow. it's the order. Now, the third is going to be your mission. And so it's the M's, right? It's, it's what's, it's, it's meaning, it's, it's, it's worldview, it's mm -hmm. marriage and it's mate and it's, it's mission in that order. And so you have to kind of figure out and keep them in that order. If I had done this earlier, I would have made marriage the first priority and I would have gotten married a lot. I would have searched to see what's true about the world first. Didn't do any of that. Dumbed into it. Here we are. If I could change one thing, that would be it. Well, and hey, look at how you turned out pretty okay in my mind. So if you're listening and you're like, crap, I didn't do any of that right. <laughs> yes. So. yes, that's right. Um, meaning marriage mission. I love that. I once heard it put marriage is the one thing. If you get that right, everything can be wrong and you'll be okay. If you get that wrong, everything can be right and you will be a mess. That's right. Um, so, and Jim, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you? Where can they find your books? Where they can find your teachings? It's all at coldcasechristianity.com, coldcasechristianity.com. Do all the free stuff first. You don't need to buy a book until you've exhausted what's available for free. And then our books are all listed, listed there too. So, but yeah, this is, I think this is what we're trying to do. It's trying to change the world one article, one podcast, one video at a time. Oh, Jim, thank you so much for your time. This was a delight. And I'm just so excited for this wisdom to reach this generation. Thanks so much you. for having me. I appreciate it. And I hope that this blessed you and encouraged you, reminded you that God gave you a unique light and it is your job to shine it in this world because we need you to. That being said, if you were blessed by this message and you can think of anybody else that also needs this type of encouragement, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment. Uh, it helps me out a lot and helps this message that I do believe God gave my heart to share with the world gets out. I hope you have such a an amazing rest of your day.